Okay, this is a recording for the Carpet Project. My name is Chris McCann. Today is the 2nd of May 2023 and I have with me here Martin Cobb. Thank you very much, Martin, for, for being with us. Can you confirm for the recorder that you're happy to take part in this project? Yep, I'm happy to take part in the project, yeah. Great. Uh, and could you spell your name for the recorder, please? M-A-R-T-I-N-C-O-D-D, -D, Martin Codd. Okay, so we might just start with um, just a bit of background about mm. yourself. Can you mm. tell us what's what are your what are your earliest me earliest memories of of growing up and, and being in this area? Um, I suppose I, I grew up on a farm um, about six seven miles from here, and um, as such, I went to school at six. And I have a few memories before that memories that I do remember uh, special occasions and things like that. I remember um, an aunt of mine, a grand aunt of mine, who uh, died uh, when I was three. And I do remember her. I remember my mum bringing her tea in, in, in the bed. And uh, I remember her funeral. Now, I would have been three at that stage. And uh, probably because it was a standout occasion, I did remember it, but I uh, I remember uh, my dad hurling and uh, hearing his name on the radio on that when I was about four, that kind of an age, I used to recognise his name of Michal O'Hare in the hurling commentaries. And um, those are the type of things. I remember him having an operation for appendicitis and uh, worrying uh, about him as regards uh, would he be okay and things like that. But um, he obviously was because he hurled a match six weeks later, so <laughs> I didn't have too much of an effect on him. <laughs> but um, those are the things, the standout memories that I have. Like, and I do remember my first day in school, I, I remember actually feeling like I was going to cry when my mum walked out of the room, but um, I didn't cry because it wouldn't have been the thing to do, like, you know. So <laughs> things like that, I remember, I remember um, when I started the school first, my cousin Mary Reddy who was was uh, uh, the same age as me and um, I played with the girls for the first few weeks in school because I didn't know any boys and um, we uh, eventually I was kind of uh, told that it isn't done that way that you play with the boys and the girls play with the girls but um, that, I, I do remember that I remember um, <laughs> one of the first days I was in school one of the big lads came over and he caught me and turned me upside down and held me upside down and then let me down gently again and that was it <laughs> and um, he he was just uh, a big friendly guy and uh, he was a friend ever since and um, that's just just silly things you remember about your first day in school or your first couple of days in school I remember my teachers um, one of my teachers was uh, Mrs Skelton and she was uh, 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 an ex common man and um, very much uh, of that ilk and uh, taught us uh, about uh, the usual things. It taught us our prayers and our, our um, say, the Angelus and uh, all, all the tables and uh, spellings and stuff like that. She was a, um, a, a teacher and probably most suited to younger children as opposed to older children. And then uh, the next class that we had, the next step was three. We spent three years in her room and then went to a Miss Kelly who was from Carrigan Shore and um, lived in Euros. And she was a lovely, gentle woman who um, uh, taught us singing and this type of thing, but uh, I always remember her teaching us how to sing to open our mouth nice and wide. <laughs> Some people took her for granted. <laughs> it was <laughs> peculiar to see people singing and opening their mouth way too wide, like, but just because we're, she was, we were being told to open our mouth, <laughs> open our mouth wide while we were singing. But um, those were the kind of things. It had a very, a very pleasant, um, uh, time in school, um, enjoyed every moment of it. I couldn't say I was ever, I was ever um, disillusioned or anything like that. Yeah. And, and that was in Rathnure? That was in Rathnure, yeah. And um, the second, uh, 
The exam in Ratnewar was uh, the primary school exam and uh, I think it was uh, a pretty good example of uh, or, or a record of what the school was like because uh, there was only two of us, uh, I'd say half the class did the primary exam, the rest of them didn't seem to want to do it or their parents didn't want to do it or whatever but about half the, the school showed up to do it and there was only two of us passed which I was one and there was another girl who passed as well and um, that was that, that was all who passed that and when we moved on to uh, I went to secondary school in Uras Good Council College and um, I knew the first couple of days that I was there that I was um, a little bit behind other lads who had been in better schools, maybe better schools. But um, we seemed to, uh, long division was one of the things that I didn't know before I went to um, secondary school. And um, that gave me a bit of problems. And a, a few other things about Irish. I remember uh, the first day there was a uh, an Irish teacher there, Professor O'Mahon, he was his name. No, I'm not. He was a, a lovely man, the very best of a man. But he he gave me the chalk and told me to write Gaelic, Gael, Gael, on Galen. On Galen was the way that meant Irish, the Irish on Galen. And uh, I went up and I wrote Gael Lynn, which was uh, a, a company that uh, a kind of. Uh, produced books and records and things like that of Irish but uh, <laughs> he laughed at me but he understood that I was interested because I was listening to Irish music and stuff like that if I knew about these guys and that was, that was about it but he, he, he was a lovely man he taught us English and Irish and um, I got on very well with, with, with him and um, uh, I loved uh, the new the new type of things we learned, I learned Latin and Greek and uh, science and we had a brand new science laboratory built the for i was the first uh, class to went to that was my class and uh, we enjoyed that because all the chemicals were there we had all the the dangerous stuff and all these kind of things were, were there to be playing around with <laughs> i think everybody had a, a pen full of mercury by the time that <laughs> you to fill up the the pen with the mercury and should be hardly able to lift it off the table <laughs> But um, yeah, it was a uh, good council. It, it was an Augustinian co uh, boarding college, but I didn't board in it. Um, my mum and dad drove us for the first couple of years in and out, and then uh, the free transport came in. Donnacho O'Malley was the guy who introduced that. He was the Minister for Education at the time, and um, that, that was a major introduction to Irish life because everybody now could go to secondary school. Prior to that, uh, there was very few people, not very few, I'd say about half the, the, the class would have gone to secondary school. The other half would have uh, got work or jobs uh, locally or maybe in Enniscorthy or New Ross or something like that. But after the after the, the free transport was brilliant. And it didn't matter that much that it was free. I'd say people would have contributed to it if they needed to, people had become aware of education and that education was important. I think that most people by that time understood that, that the way to go was, was uh, education. Now, um, lots of guys, uh, I suppose l lots of people got work with farmers and things like that and uh, some of it would have been seasonal. You'd be working, um, maybe you'd work tin and turnips or weed and, weed and turnips or whatever you want to call it but in our time it was tin and turnips or horn turnips which the horn ho, horn turnips or beet you did that walking alongside it with a, a long a long handled uh, hoe and the tinning was you uh, crept up and down between the drills and tinned by hand and um, that was quite a well paid job if you were good at it, you got good money for, for tin and beet or tin and turnips because you were paid by the drill. So it was in your own interest how much you earned rather than other jobs. And as picking potatoes was a kind of a job that the, the, the digger, mechanical digger went up along with 
turned all the potatoes out to one side and then a whole shower of young lads descended on them and picked them into baskets and then you had to have that section cleared before the guy came back with the, with the, the machine to throw them out again. And you did the same thing again, you did the very same job every time with every drill. But that was a flat rate of pay, but the, the, you were paid by the, you made an agreement with, with the farmer for the, whatever length of drill was, you got so much for a long drill, and then if it was a short drill, you got less, and this kind of thing. Strawberries were introduced around that time as well, and picking strawberries was a, a great job. And it was a job that um, lots of people, um, you know, they brought their children with them, and some of them would be very well behaved, that they pick like mad and make right money. And um, more people get fed up with you know, hanging around doing very little, but um, picking s strawberries and raspberries was quite a well-paid job as well in the in the summertime. But anyhow, in the in the good council, the good council, uh, it had lots of sports and stuff like that. And for that reason, I was I was very interested in in the college, and I was interested in the the new subjects and things that uh, I learned from new. I, I was very good at that, and uh, loved lo loved every minute I spent in the place. I never I never uh, never felt felt uh, out of place or anything else in it. And there was guys there from all over Ireland, which uh, I got us used to all the different accents. They had Meath, Kerry, and Cork, and Tipperary in Dublin, and and uh, the Dublin guys always always were a little bit smarter than the country fellows, <laughs> a little bit cuter. <laughs> Uh, some of them even used to used to uh, get us to put on bets on horses and things like that at the bookies. Like they'd have money because they'd be given money for for the school shop or whatever, like you know. But some of them were quite enterprising, <laughs> and uh, they would w w would ask us to put on a bet and be maybe two shillings each way on a on, on a horse, like you know. <laughs> but uh, we could do that. But uh, you wouldn't want a guard to see you doing it because you were under age, like you know. But the bookie didn't mind once he got the money, <laughs> and the priests were sound as well. The priests were very, the they were. Somewhat different to the to the the what do you call them? There's a name on the parish priest. Like there's a, a word for it. I can't remember what it is. But anyway, the parish priests always seem to be more severe and more more um, I don't know more more. Uh, we talked to the priests in the college. They were they were teachers half the time. About half of them were te teachers, and the other half were were um, laymen. But um, they talked to us on our own level, whereas the priest, uh, the parish priests, uh, there was good and bad, the same as everything, but some of those were, were, they didn't want to do a whole lot of talking, and there you ask them a question. That um, I know in, in the good council, there used to be a kind of a mission every year, or a kind of a, they used to call it a, a mission, so some kind of, um, um, just, uh, priest from some other college or something to come down and talk to you and you could ask him any question he'd answer the question give you the same answer as you'd expect to give yourself that kind of a way that that, that, that it wasn't prearranged or in shielded in in language we didn't understand he spoke to speak to you on your own your own in your own language right but um <laughs> I remember one time asking, asking uh, we have to make up the questions as he asked the priest, but we asked this particular priest one time, anyhow, what was French kissing? That, uh, you know, the usual questions a young lads have been, <laughs> been thinking about. And um, he talked for a minute and he said, it's uh, when the boy inserts his tongue into the girl's mouth, he says, it's not recommended. <laughs> That was his his answer to that, but that was um, I I enjoyed the time in there because the the priests were were very ordinary men and had been around a bit. Uh, good few had been in Africa and South America and places like that, and they came back and a lot of them came back in quite poor health. That, uh, their health had failed while they were out there, and that's why they came back. But um, um, the good guys. And while I was in there, a lot of changes happened in in the religious. And 
I knew three priests who taught me there by the time I had left, had left the priesthood and got married. That, uh, that whole thing was changing at that stage. And uh, I think the Augustinians were one of the first to recognize that and allowed fellas to leave if they really wanted to leave. They, they allowed them to leave without any big hullabaloo. And um, the priest would just be teaching you now and maybe the next uh, semester or whatever you want to call it, he wouldn't be there. And um, somebody would tell you that he had left the priesthood and that he was gone to Scotland or somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. But um, that was, that was uh, my days in there. I stayed there up to uh, intermediate level and uh, I suppose um, I didn't really recognise him myself I suppose but I'd say my father recognised that uh, maybe if I went to a vocational school for a year it would be a help. I, I, I was never going to be an academic that uh, I, 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 I always consider myself quite smart as regards I could understand most of what I was taught but I probably never never uh, did enough studying or anything like that there's always several other things to be doing that, um, besides studying and uh, I thought that um, I went into the vocational school in Ross for a year and uh, that, that I, I enjoyed that because I didn't have to work at all at Irish and English I didn't have to do anything of that because I was ahead of the lads I was in school with and uh, the carpentry, metalwork, mechanical drawing and mechanical drawing was the best thing I ever did because it got me to a stage where I could read drawings and I was able to get good quality foremen's jobs on sites and things like that and metric came in, we were taught metric, we were the first class to have metric uh, presented to us as, as an alternative to feet and inches and I got jobs after that at 22 and 23 years of age um, four men on a site of maybe 100 houses in Dublin and at that kind of an age it was unusual because to be lads there who would be a major amount of experience but they didn't want to learn metric and didn't want to know about it and uh, for that reason they wouldn't have got the, the job and I got jobs like that but um, that was just from from being in the right place at the right time and um i was always a good worker i was always always uh i'd run from one place to the other that kind of i i, I was i was probably quite efficient that way that, that I'd, I'd, I'd put in the the time doing the job and getting it right but uh i had a kind of um i got fed up in the one place at the one time for a long time i always liked to be a kind of free and independent and for that reason I started uh, working um, as a kind of uh, self-employed and stuff like that and uh, went back to the stonework. I, was, I, I, I served my time for three years at stonework uh, after leaving school. That was the first, the first thing that, that I did and um, I got a, a good training in stonework when stonework was dying out and uh, one of the places that we went to, one of the first was the Quaker School in Waterford, Newtown, Newtown College, and that was was a, a big, a big uh, project building a stone wall. You know that kind of way that they, they were changing around building new buildings, and they had to move stuff. But rather than just demolish the wall, they moved it, a stone wall. Like, you know, see, uh, Digger took it down, and then we. Um, a fellow called John Cullen was my instructor or, or that's where I served my time too and he had he had worked on lots of churches and um, stone buildings and things like that and he was a good, good stone mason a very a serious operator but um, um, you, you did what you were told with him that was one thing for sure but I considered him a very fair kind of a guy that he'd, he'd You'd uh, talk away and no problem, whatever. But if he told you to do something, you did it and did it as good as you were able, that kind of way. And in the evening, then, no matter how cold or how warm the weather was, he uh, washed his tools and all before <laughs> before you went off about your business. That he, he was a kind of the old style um, uh, mason who expected the apprentice to look after him, that kind of way. But um, that. That was how I came into to doing stonework at all. But 
for I suppose 10 or 15 years I didn't do any stonework. Stonework had became old fashioned and uh, very few people were building stone of any description. And then when uh, roads began to get widened and things like that then and uh, I started working for Ascon rebuilding bridges and stuff like that that were widened and changed and um, I found uh, that I liked it and I, I, I could, the fact that I had uh, served my time, I, had, I was good at it, whereas most other guys were trained as bricklayers or block layers and they didn't have the same, um, probably they found it difficult to start doing it, but uh, I had a jump start on most people that way because I was, I, I had served my time to a guy who was an actual stonemason. And um, I've been doing stonework ever since. About, um, I'd say, end of the 70s. From the end of the 1970s on up to today, I, I, I've done stone or some way involved in stonework. But um, that's that's me up as far as there now. But, um, and, and what year were you born? I was born in 1951. Yeah, so 51. In your 20s when you sort of... Yeah, yeah. 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 If you're interested about the stonework, so obviously you trained um, you know, under a, a man that was very good at his yeah, craft. Yeah, he was, yeah. And I think it sort of relates to the, um, the local area here. How much did you learn about the, the different types of stone, about um, their, their, their origin, their strength, mm. their, or, or anything to do with them? And, mm. how that, and were, were any of those materials you know, obtained from around this yeah, area? Yeah, there was, yeah. There, there's, uh, mainly uh, churches around this local area had what they called formal corners or coins. Those are the big ones up the side, you probably know that, but um, the rest of it was called random rubble, which was uh, whatever was local to the area. And uh, you mix that, uh, that went in usually in courses. And the courses were what they call a day course. The, uh, uh, you go about a foot high. They went the same height as the kind. The kind stone uh, defined the height of the course. So they were usually 12 or 13 inches. And um, you built the, the, the intermediate one then between the doors or the windows or the kinds on the corner. You built oh, that was a lesser type stone than, than granite. And uh, that was usually built uh, in courses of 12 inches. And um, then a lot of churches had formal jams and, and coins and mullions around the windows and doors. Like So a lot, of the, a lot of granite was used there, but a lot of that granite was quarried or stuff. Not even quarried, they were boulders that were broken and brought down from, from up the mountain here. And um, um, nearly all. Uh, some of them, the real formal work was brought in from England, but most of them were, uh, some of them were brought from France as well, strange it may seem that some of the churches brought stuff in from France, but um, uh, a lot of it uh, came to places like New Ross from, from Cornwall, and, and uh, there was a stone, Dundery stone is what they call it, it was, uh, uh, from an area in, in England, southern England, and that the east coast of Ireland had a lot of dundry stone used as the it was a form of sandstone and it was easy to work on all the, the little uh, quadrants and, and trifiles of churches were built out of those because they were easy, easy to shape and um, they looked very very formal then like you know but um, even back in the 14th and 15th centuries they were still they, they had started using that, that uh, dundry stone from England that time and we'd find a lot of that today still in some of the old churches like yeah was there um, was there any sort of value placed on local stone or was it regarded as was it regarded yeah. as rubble uh, no that the, the most granite would have been used for building some farm or even cow sheds or whatever because it was a very durable type of stone and quite easy to work now, uh, most of the boulders around here are uh, quite soft granite, but granite is an unusual stone that uh, it, it, um, it's easily split into workable pieces and then pitched to suit, the, you know, to make them square or whatever, but they were, they were, they were easy to work really. Like you get some flint and stuff like that that's 
I don't know, terrible hard, too hard altogether, like, you know. But, um, and then you look at other places, like it appears in, in Dunleary and places like that, they were used, uh, what they called, um, docky granite, or the quarry in docky, and that stuff uh, was fierce hard, really, really hard, and hard to manage, hard to do anything with, like, you know. But um, the stone around here was much softer than that, and there were what they call erratics. That there were there were uh, five or six different types of granite that had washed down with the glaciers, and um, they they you could find those anywhere around here in the black stairs or any of those kind of places, and uh, they were quite kind and and uh, you know easy to work with. And a lot of stuff around here is is like that. But uh, if you're in Carlo now, most of the, the granite in Carlo is done without any, what we call levelers, which would be little flagstones that you put in. Whereas in Wexford, an awful lot had the informal part of the stone where you're levelling up to a, a piece of granite, you'd put in a, a, a piece of uh, slate or shale or something like that that would, would uh, level it. You wouldn't have to cut a piece of granite to the right height. You just put in a bit of a flag or slate or stuff like that. Like, And that, that um, uh, most of Wexford granite houses or buildings are done with a certain amount of slate in them. Whereas Carlow tended to, around Boris and the Harry there down from Stone from Mount Leinster and the Harry there, that was all done with all granite. There was very little uh, slate mixed through it. There's a slate quarry up in Bunkhody. Yeah, that's there? right. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a lot of the the um, say the waste from the slate quarry would have been used for for building stuff like that. And then there's some some of the buildings in Bunkhody are all slate. They're, they're built with slate. There's a little place there beside what they call make the chippers. There's a, a little building there that was the way bridge. I built that. Now the old stone was salvaged, and uh, but the the building was taken down and moved a little bit, and the way bridge was put in. But there's only the the only the um, the slab of the way bridge. There's no uh, no me mechanism for weighing anything in the hand anymore. It's just the the the, the cast iron plate is there. And um, the building is uh, slated with slate from that quarry in Montlaudy. And uh, some of those slates were they were considered to be a little, they wouldn't have been as good now as, say, uh, uh, Killaloo slates. There's a very good quarry in Killaloo. And uh, a lot more used to come in from Wales and, and England as regards uh, Bangor. And uh, they were a, a good slate, a real, real. Uh, hard slate. The stuff in in uh, in the one in, in Montlaudy tended to be more porous and for that reason frost was a problem with it because it had soaked water and then the frost had come out and it had split and flake and uh, they, were, they were considered to be less less valuable than the, and they were smaller as well. If you were putting on slates and you have a slate that's 18 inches by 12 you'll cover a lot of ground but if you're dealing with something that's 3 inches by 9 you won't cover as much ground, and that's that's the way they are. But um, there's some lovely old buildings with uh, the old um, Bunclody slate on them still. You know that that uh, well minded and maybe reused, and uh, a lot of them would have been pegged rather than nails. They would have been oak pegs holding them on rather than nails. The na nails would rust, whereas the oak pegs wouldn't, and uh, they they lasted quite well. Like, that. but um, just. Uh, the, you use what materials were around you, I suppose, the way it was. But I wouldn't be a great expert on on uh, stone and old buildings. I worked on lots of old buildings and stuff like that. But to be other guys out there, they would have studied them and studied uh, why they're that way or why this or that or whatever. Like, and, um, I'd I'd um, I'd be interested in it, but I never studied it formally. Whereas uh, there would be guys who would have studied architecture and would have uh, have a, 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 a quite a good knowledge of stuff like that, but um, I I never did. I never never went to a third level college or anything like that. But that um, you you learn a good bit by listening. If you listen to people and listen to um, and reading reports on old buildings and stuff like that, 
And the funny thing about it is you could you get so used to reading them that they were even using an old form of, of cut and paste that uh, did be <laughs> some fellow would find a, a nice well written written report and he'd uh, dissect that to suit his own his own way of doing things and a lot of the words in it he mightn't really understand them but they sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, reading stuff like, you know, and I, I, come around, yeah, I wrote that uh, 15 years ago and I wonder, uh, he, he's copying me, <laughs> those kind of stuff, but um, yeah, no, that, that, um, I wouldn't be working still if I hadn't um, been doing stonework because I'd have a good interest in it and uh, I was lucky enough to survive. Uh, um, no accidents or anything like that. That I I I'd be quite fit still, and um, I'd like to think that I'd 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 hold me own against most fellas still, and uh, fellas half my age. But uh, it's just uh, uh, you get to a, a, a speed, I suppose, comes into it to a certain degree. But um, recognizing what stone you need without doing too much walking around. There's, there's guys could build a wall without stern from the wall, whereas I was never as good as that. I'd have to do a little bit of fiddling through a pile of stones to find the one I thought might work, but the really good guys could just stand in one place and make the stone fit, you know, uh, find a place for every stone that was around them. And those were the, the real old genuine guys, the real old old uh, stonemasons. There'll be very few of them working today at that kind of a game, but more of them than split stone to suit. They'd split a granite, sp split a big granite stone, and um, they wouldn't have square sides on it. Whatever shape the stone came, or whatever s shape was needed to fill a place, they'd chip the stone to suit that. And uh, if you ever looked at Galway Cathedral, that uh, building is done like that. The, the, all the corner stones are all formal, but the rest of them are all shaped to suit the the lines of the last stone that went in. And there's a couple of guys here from just a couple of miles up the road worked on that that uh, Galway Cathedral, and uh, you'd see their work around here still, and it's matching the very same as the Galway Cathedral form of doing things like yeah, They were a family called uh, O'Neill's was their name. They, they lived up in Kiltili. But um, he, they were the last of the old breed of stone mates. You know, there's uh, nephews and sons, one nephew and I think a son of another man uh, up there that still do that type of work. You know, they like to take the stone from its original form in big chunks and break it into manageable pieces and, and build a wall I would like. I never n never did a lot of that kind of work but uh, my work was mainly repairing older buildings where uh, the stone was already there. You just uh, took it down and if there's a couple missing you made one to suit it and that was it like but they attended, the lads in Kiltaley attended to um, you know they, they got great satisfaction out of um, making a wall out of just stone that uh, was got in its natural state, big lumps of granite. But um, yeah, a diff different way of doing things, yeah. You've raised um, a couple of really interesting things there and uh, you mentioned um, uh, that you like to, to move around. Yeah. Um, so yeah. can you tell me more about uh, sort of the, the movements that you've made throughout Ireland and perhaps mm. um, your relationship with with this place mm. while you were moving around? Mm. Well, um, I was. I, I don't know why it was that I, I, I kind of, I'd get fed up in the one area, I'd get fed up working at the one type of thing the whole time and I'd like to, even, even still, I'd like to, to have three or four places in the year that, uh, you know, I often had ten places, but three or four different projects going on at roughly the same time. I always like like to work that way. That, that you can get very, very kind of um, fed up at uh, repetitive work. I wouldn't be great for, for repetition or anything like that, but yeah, that, um, I was quite good at blocks when blocks came out uh, first and probably because I spent a while in London. Uh, when we got married first, um, we moved to London for about a year only, but I worked on, on a lot of buildings over there 
um, different types of brickwork and uh, got to know the the formula for doing really for setting up a building or setting up a house so as that uh, time and motion that you weren't running around one after the other that things happened in a rotation you put up a good scaffold and then you lifted the stuff onto it or you got guys who were good at lifting stuff onto it and putting out plenty of spot boards in ireland when i was training most fellas working on buildings worked with a roundy trowel on a out of a bucket do you know what i mean they didn't have a good quality trowel and um, spot boards laid out uh, at the right distance apart and everything like that and it was in England I learned that kind of stuff and most of my generation of block layers or stone masons would have uh, spent time in England and would have seen that system and the first to bring that system around here uh, as a builder was McInerney's. McInerney's were a big company or clear men and uh, they, they, they had a nice uh, way of working you know what i mean that the, there was a formula to it and uh, and uh they kind of they were the first the high side it's a house uh, the way i think in dublin there would have been other companies like sisk and 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 um they were older companies up there well-established companies and they had a formula for working but um a lot of those did did uh, dublin corporation housing and stuff like that where there was a formula to everything like but um, around locally in country places, there was very little of that. It was, um, there would have been formal uh, apprentices serving their time as carpenters and masons, and nearly every uh, uh, trade had, had a, a system of, of apprentice. But um, it worked. You really had to be had to be working in a situation where some of those formulas were working to to really appreciate how good an idea it was to do things that way. Because when this houses came out, uh, your man that did the bungalow bliss book, where all the houses it was uh, maybe five or six different style of houses. But if you look around you at houses that were built in the sixties and seventies, they all look relatively the same, bigger or smaller, but relatively the same style of uh, housing and they got a very bad name because all, they, were all, they were all the same they reckon they destroyed the country but they provided houses to the whole country just the same like but, um, I remember working uh, in places like New Ross and Enniscarty and I worked on all those council houses that were built hundreds of them and I mean literally hundreds of them built in New Ross and Enniscarty and Wexford and uh, I'd say in the last 15 years there wouldn't have been a uh, take rat newer for a, a start off. There's uh, three different little schemes of houses in rat newer, all done by the council, all very well built and all in, in good nick. People go into them and uh, they start off paying rent. After a few years, when they get themselves established and get their family kind of halfway there, they buy the house. So there's very little wrong with that system, but for one reason or another, uh, somebody thought better that everything should happen through the, the main government rather than through the county councils and I, I, I reckon it was a bad move because uh, the councils built hundreds of houses every year they, they no longer do and they uh, were in trouble enough because of that but um, I don't know I, don't, I really don't know why why um, the housing building houses were let slip and um, I'd say it had something to do with with uh, hiring enough guys uh, as um, clerks of work. Now, um, there was always a clerk of works on houses when I was a young lad building block and brick houses. And they were good guys and they kept an eye on the way things were done. But now, um, a lot of those houses that were built in Dublin and apartments and stuff like that, they failed because of, of uh, a lack of inspection and stuff like that. There's, major problems with things like that self-regulation doesn't work in anything you have to have some some uh, some higher form of authority that says you're doing a thing right or wrong and uh, we don't have that at the moment in the house and we didn't have it for the last 20 years when we lost all the the the, the houses there was no houses built in the country for 20 years that um you know no um, local authority houses 
and uh, it's a pity the slip so far because it's gone now that there are no um there's not enough regulators out there there's not enough clerks of work and um people who um supervisors and things like that they're just, they're just not there the council are not employing them they're not building houses but I, I don't know what they're going to do to improve that but uh, uh, uh self-regulation is not going to do it they're going to have to have have uh, some kind of uh um you know authority to tell you how to do things and stick to it so so when did you live in london um 71 and maybe early 72 yes. I, I was only about a year year and a half in london and um it was uh i really enjoyed working in it and uh, made a few pounds and um but still wanted to come back and never wanted to settle in in london and um i i saw both sides of london really because um i didn't drink at all i i, I was always a teetotaler or whatever you want to call it I, I i just never saw the need for alcohol i saw too much uh things messing with 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 drink really but uh, i never got involved in the drinking culture of the english or london setup that uh, i always uh, went to work and then we work and then went home and uh, never got involved at all in that but there was a system over there uh, that irish fellows tended to very much not integrate with the english people they went into uh, areas where they dealt with nobody, only other Irish people. And um, a lot of them, uh, I suppose, three quarters of them came through it without too many problems. But an awful lot of people had major problems over there. And you can see that today with older guys that worked on the buildings in England and uh, some were in a pretty bad state. But um, it was a funny kind of a setup that, that it was totally unregulated as well that there was uh you paid no tax a lot of the time and there was no no uh no you know that, that you got whatever you were offered that kind of way now uh the fellas who brickies generally made good money carpenters generally made good money but the, the guy carrying the hod or doing all the donkey work he was poorly paid enough you know what i mean that that uh, very poorly paid i'd say but and even her smart uh, made money and had had a, a good life over there and maybe had a couple of houses people who um bought a house and then uh, maybe moved into a bigger one but kept their small one as well and rented that house a lot of guys did that but um and after that fellas went to england just for a short length of time to get a few pounds and then came back as well like you know and uh, a lot of them learned learned trade a lot of guys learned painting and a kind of um, one-man operations that you could be a painter if you had the right qualification and knew enough about the job if you're able to paint something leave a tidy job behind you plumbers and electricians generally learn their trade in england like you know same way with block layers and off them learn their trade o o over in england like but um i i we only stayed over there about i know a big strike came over there and that was we came home during that that big strike that uh, it was something that um, I had registered as a subcontractor at that stage over there as well. And um, the first big job that I got uh, was with McInerney's. And uh, when the job stopped, when the, you know, when the strike came, there was nothing for us to do. So rather than stay there wondering about it, we came home. That was about it. Like, but in the meantime, I'd been playing music for for uh, I suppose I did it for three years really uh, without working at all. Like, you know, kind of from the time I was about uh, I started learning guitar when I was thirteen. But by the time I was I was fourteen, I was playing nearly full time. That kind of way, and uh, that old ballad boom type thing was had come in at that stage where anybody who could hold a guitar was uh, a member of a band like you know and uh, it, it, it was strange really but that um it's a great time really when you think about it like because the pubs are all building big extra lounges and big big function rooms and and 
a kind of uh, you know venues rather than just the public you know but uh, I remember playing in pubs where there was maybe three rooms in a row up along and you had to go through one to get to the other and we'd usually be putting the farthest away one from the bar and uh, as the place would fill up then there'd be pure bedlam trying to get from one place to the other and the barman trying to get up with drinks to the fellas up in the upper room like you know but maybe five fellas standing around one microphone to try to be heard like you know but as uh, I was a young lad I really enjoyed it. Perhaps we'll, um, we'll ask about your music then, uh, so maybe a good segue. Maybe you can tell me what it was like uh, as a very young man, so you started, when you first started learning music and what the sort of musical culture was like around mm. this area. Mm. Um, the first music that we did were um, generally what they call, referred to as ballads. Now, uh, if you look at look up a ballad in the dictionary, it's a, a special formula of writing a song or a poem or whatever a ballad was, was one way of doing it. And you had sonnets and things were different and uh, all that type of stuff. But there's, what there were an awful lot more rebel songs, you know what I mean? And uh, the, the, um, there were an awful lot of uh, all the big big rebel songs about fellas dying of, of, for Ireland and this kind of thing and they were quite good songs some were quite well written and there was some some uh, songs put fast songs put to the air of well known Irish uh, music tunes you know what I mean that, that, that they, were, they were quite simple to play that a uh, couple of cards, three cards, and you were up and running like you didn't need a, a, a big vocabulary or anything like that to, 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 to play guitar. But um, there was a good bit of Irish music around the place. Uh, I mean, uh, traditional Irish music with accordions and fiddles and flutes and stuff like that. But um, that had kind of passed me by because uh, the Beatles had happened, and uh, the Clancy Brothers were were a big, big. Thing. Would you be familiar with the Clancy Brothers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that the four songs that we ever did on stage, my dad, my uncle, and myself, and uh, two other guys, a fellow called Paddy Joyce and uh, Peter Farrell, and uh, we latched on very quick onto that Clancy Dubliners type of type of stuff. And that was what we did for the first couple of years, that uh, the pubs were beginning to hire musicians and that kind of thing. Like, but and how old were you around this? 13, 13, yeah. And, uh, Playing in the pubs. Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, surely, yeah. But my dad was a non-drinker as well, so that was a help. And uh, um, it was just uh, it was great, great, great life, great pastime. And uh, all of us had money. That, uh, um, I remember serving my time, I was getting um, three pounds, three shillings as far as started out as an often made that one night playing. You know what I mean? Where I was working five days for, for my three pounds, three shillings. <laughs> I had more money from music than I had from work, like, you know. And uh, as the progress on then, like, we, we did that for probably only about a year that we were uh, totally doing ballads and stuff like that. but. We were we were quite good. There's a lot of ballad competitions out as well, like where uh, Guinness would sponsor uh, stuff like that. We won a lot of that stuff, and uh, we also uh, got to know the way the business worked, and uh, met met guys who had made it before us and knew the formula, knew how it might work, that kind of a way. But that um, we did that for a couple of years, and then we kind of decided to do uh, country type dance band which would be uh, we for one reason or another uh, had most of the stuff we did was American of the of the country stuff that I used to listen to a country called AFN to the American Forces Network and they were transmitting from Germany to their own troops over there and you could get that on the old radio long way radio actually you could get them on the on the the medium I have as well but um, uh, I began listening to a lot of uh, American stuff that time and uh, I used to get there was a guy in Ross would import records if you asked him he was able to he had a contact in, in America or somewhere and he'd get you the, the, the stuff and that was the like of uh, Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings Willie Nelson really hadn't come on the scene but uh, 
we used to listen to um, Jimmy Rogers and people like that who were, were older, much older than me, um, for this music. When I think of the day I was born, Hank Williams recorded three songs that day. Now, whereas now it would take three weeks to record one, but he recorded three hits the one day. And I, 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 that's who was big when I was born. Now, uh, the Beatles were 10 years after that. So uh, the first two years of the Beatles washed over me. I thought the Beatles were two years on the road before I latched on to them. And the reason I didn't latch on to them a lot was that the music played in our house generally was uh, Bing Crosby and uh, American people like that who were, were tenors and uh, did that kind of music. Now, my dad was an exceptional singer. He had a, a really brilliant voice. And uh, when he was young, they wanted them to go to Dublin and be taught how to sing, you know, the, 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 the go to real singer. But that, uh, one of my granddads was in the Abbey Theatre and she would have had contact with guys who would have taught him to sing that kind of a way. But um, being a farmer and whatever, it was either you stayed on the farm or if you went to Dublin, you had to have something else to be doing. But he, he probably liked farming and that was it. He didn't want to move anyhow, but he, 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 he always sang at concerts and functions and things like that. He was always singing around the place. He'd always sing, sing you know, all the... 50s hit tunes and I remember all those and, and he could sing all those like you know? but um, we we um, formed that country type band then and uh, that lasted for I'd say I played for three years and, and what instrument did you play? Guitar. guitar I never really uh, did much on any other instrument I could knock a tune out of most instruments but I couldn't uh, I would be proficient enough to even join the group to do it like you know but um, I kind of went to learn music one time. There was a guy who started giving classes in Ratnewer. And for one reason or another, he used to do it on a Friday night, and that was when I was gigging. So I didn't get to stay going to that, like, you know. But I learned enough uh, about how to read music to be actually able to read it, but I was never able to read it as fast as I'd play it. But I could figure out a piece of music if I took the time to look at it and go through it, like, you know. My dad was the same. He kind of knew the air of a song, but if he had the notes in front of him, he'd know whether they were going up or down, and uh, he could follow it that way, like, you know. But um, most of the stuff you learn by ear rather than any other way, like. But um, we very seldom did any original stuff. We never wrote songs or anything like that. We did write bits and pieces of yokes, but they're usually a kind of ballady type things that um, attribute to this or because of that or whatever. Like we, we never wrote a, a song for the sake of the song, like, you know, never sang at all that way. But we got kind of sidetracked. Do you remember Horse Lips or Heard, heard Tell of Horse Lips, the type of stuff? Mm -hmm. And there was a few bands started playing that kind of stuff, and we had the instrumentation to do it, but we were a bit late behind uh, going down it. We were probably um, a year behind Horse Lips as regards doing, doing the stuff. And it, it was an unusual way of you put a bit of a, a swing to it. And maybe some of the lads were a bit old to appreciate that, uh, to play music that way. That Horse Lips were young lads when they, when they started out like, and, and uh, they changed the, the kind of made, made uh, modern Irish song sound good, you know, that kind of way. And, and even the, the, they took old songs and, and they kind of worked a bit of uh, rock and roll into them, like, but the, once the dance bands, once the dance halls closed and all the, the, that era, they talk about the show band era, the show band era lasted about 15 years, that was it, gone. That uh, the disco took over and the disco bars and disco venues, nightclubs and stuff like that. But um, I remember walking down the street in Limerick one night. We used to go in and put up the gear. There's a place called Jetland. 
that uh, Albert Friend was going to hold a uh, ballroom in the raw land, something the raw called one here in Ross at Barrowland, and you had Jetland and you had Moatland, and those were all, I think, had 12 or 14 of them, but uh, they were all that. But we were playing in Jetland, and we went out and put up the gear, and then there would a uh, band come in and play for a couple of hours, and then we'd one maybe around 11 or that way and play for the rest of the night. But, you go into town and you get something to eat, to see, and the, the hall usually laid on something in some of the restaurants or something like to go eat, but we were coming back, we parked up to see, we went in and got the grub and we were coming back out, and I heard this music going on inside, in a, can I describe it, a narrow street, and then a, a little door going in, halfway down, maybe 20 metres down or something, and I ran down to see what was, who was playing or what it was, and just stepped inside the door, and there was one guy, on stage with an ordinary record player and uh, he was uh, given it loads and the whole place dancing and uh, on that day I realised that the dance bands were a kind of a little bit gone out of date and it took maybe a year or two before the disco scene took off. It took off in the cities first like, and then it came out to all the, all the usual villages and whatever like, like records had a good, a good nightclub. And all the hotels had a decent nightclub. They used to, you know, have a, have a Saturday or Friday night. Saturday night usually was the big night, or Sunday night even. But um, a change, the dance hall started closing down then one after another. And uh, they were generally dry until then. And at that stage, they began uh, serving drink with the music, like, and uh, that changed the scene totally. But... Um, it's it's hard to know. Um, I think any era of music it kind of runs with a generation. That uh, each generation, maybe even ten or twelve, fifteen years, maybe music changes. Uh, changes uh, that whoever is involved in the previous one can't understand where it is going or how it is going to work out. And that's the situation I was in. That uh, for that reason, I kind of reverted back to country music and uh, a concert situation rather than a dance band situation. And I always enjoyed that because it began to get difficult to earn your living out of music. Uh, and then um, the concert situation was different than it was. You had a seated audience that listened to what you were doing rather than um, just dancing to music, you know, that kind of way. A totally different aspect of of the business, like you know, but I always liked that. I always liked that. I like playing the like the Glen Eagle. Used to we used to do uh, one Friday night in Killarney. Uh, they, they did a big. They, they had a lot of American American tourists to see, and the way it worked there was that you never saw the same people. You could do the very same show over and over and over again. And uh, they were doing that in places in Dublin, like Jewelry's was one. And uh, a few of the um, bigger venues had a kind of a, a Sunday night or a Saturday night show that was geared towards the tourist industry. Like. And um, a lot of the show band people started doing that as well, like Dickie Rock and people like that. They, they spent the next 20 years of their life playing in those kind of places where they, they, they might have only done three venues mm -hmm. in the whole week, but they, they were well paid for those three venues. We used to do Killarney once a month, a Friday night once a month down there, and uh, you get more satisfaction out of playing that than you would out of doing the dance hall system. Like. But my dad and I did a good bit of that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, you know, kind of um, ordinary songs, not necessarily to any given beat, uh, a song and whatever way it was supposed to be sung or whatever you wanted to sing it and people sat down and listened and that was a, a difference like you know but uh, the more more concert uh, cabaret yeah to a certain degree but the cabaret tended to be a very lively type of stuff whereas the boss always sang a kind of uh, um, ballady type songs that uh, story songs really that, uh, like old country you know the old American country type song like that kind of stuff he was good at that and, and good at singing singing uh, some of the better Irish stuff as well like you know 
But uh, that was, that's what he preferred doing, and I, I played guitar for him. And we did that for up to the time he died, really. And um, he, he sang up to, I'd say, six months before he died. That, uh, and did concerts, I can remember playing in, in the Riverside in, in Escarte there at Bull House. And uh, I'd say that was two months before he died. But um, that's, that's the, the, ever since that I had only played uh, sessions and you know the, the concert type situation. And uh, I still like doing that. And um, uh, I'd miss music if I couldn't play music. I'd really miss music. Like I spent a lot of time listening to music as well as opposed to looking at television. I I, I like um, and. I kind of I can appreciate nearly any kind of music and uh, even techno. I like the idea of techno that that uh, it's so perfect in its timing and all of that kind of stuff. Like it is literally perfect, but I like a song to be able to be sung with one guitar. I think that an awful lot of modern music, uh, uh, popular music at the moment, unless you have a complicated computer, you won't be able to play it. <laughs> That's the, that's my understanding of it now, and I think let's come back a little bit with with, with uh, some of the 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 main singers that are out there today have brought back the the standalone song uh, more so than than it had been for maybe twenty years. That uh, you get the likes of um, you know David Kennedy like this his stuff you can sing that with one guitar. Um, maybe even Hoser, Hoser, he can do do his stuff very simple as well. Like, and uh, there's a good few young singers out there at the moment. I wouldn't be that well versed with them, but uh, very good singers, uh, a good singer. You know what I mean? As opposed to uh, um, someone who can keep time and uh, look the part, but uh, a singer who would stand alone as a singer rather than a, a group and I liked the boy bands and the, the girl bands as well I always liked those because their harmonies were so perfect you know what I mean and they're all computer generated like but uh, that didn't matter if you listen to it like you know you have to kind of blot that out and, and listen to it and, and most bands today on the road at the moment are using tracks on everything like that to be playing there as well and to be good musicians but a lot of the stuff had become an out of the back of a keyboard, like you know, and it had be it had be uh, pre-recorded, and uh, that's grand as well. I don't mind that. Uh, you have real-time correction now as well. Like if you if you go into um, some of the the big concerts, and the guy singing up there, his voice has gone through, but it's been corrected as he sings. You know what I mean? That 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 the, the computer can correct it so fast. That by the time you hear it from the minute he says it to the time you hear it, it'd be a millisecond, but it's tuned in that length of time, like you know, and he gets to know it gets to know what to do with that song to keep it in tune, like you know, that, that uh, all those would be on on, on uh, stored as tracks. And um I like that as well because you get very sweet music, like you know what I mean. Whereas if you're going to listen to a fellow with, with with one guitar, you don't mind if he's a little bit flat on an odd note or whatever. You're listening to the song and his uh, way of doing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's all it's all. Um, I think I could enjoy any kind of music if I if I wanted to, you know. But I I kind of run for the easy one to listen to. <laughs> you mentioned there sort of um, the. The sort of music that young people listening to today. You also mentioned the the venues that you would play in once. Yeah, I'm particularly interested in, in this sort of area around the, the southern lakes. Yeah. Southern lakes. Mm. So mm. How do you think opportunities for musicians from a place like this would have changed between, say, when you were playing in venues like yeah. Rapids yeah. to yeah. today? Yeah, actually, um, um, Local musicians in our day played in all the local pubs and they played in the local dance halls and they played at local um, uh, house dances and um, you know flag competitions and things like that but a lot of them never went any farther than that, they never uh, moved on and that was enough for them. 
Now, uh, the young lad today is listening to uh, whatever on YouTube, and he's hearing uh, the best people in the world doing that particular stuff. And uh, you'll see some very good young bands, but they tend to have no venues. There's no venues there to go. And I saw my own lads, and uh, they, they, they played on a circuit that would include Cork, Limerick, Galway, Dublin, and possibly Wexford, not time, but they played in those kind of places. And uh, there was probably room for 10 of those in Ireland to make it but there was 500 more that uh, just got disillusioned with the whole thing, like, you know, very good musicians. And I'd see musicians today, young fellas, 14 or 15, and uh, they'd be way ahead of me and way ahead of most lads my age because they, 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 they've seen the best all the time and they show you how to do it and, and what not to do and every leak is in it, they're able to analyse it and play it slow and then speed it up and you know, it's, it's funny about it but um, the musicians that are there today are miles ahead of what I was at that age and what I am today, like I'm, I'm it's backwards I'm going now at this stage that, that uh, I, I, I'd, um, I'd noticed myself at times if I hadn't played for a couple of weeks and uh, I'd noticed that I'd be, I'd be, I'd be rusty out but uh, play for a couple of gigs then and you kind of get back to it again you, you find yourself a kind of you're not buzzing anymore on notes or whatever vibrating or whatever like but that, um, young fellas now tend to play most of their music in their bedroom or in their garage or wherever they play it like but that um, there's there's nowhere around here like you, you think of it like to think of any small town there's nowhere for units to go to play and um, you need to be quite good for people to bother listening to you <laughs> whereas one time if you could stand up and hold the guitar you're great <laughs> you know the, 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 uh, uh, it's funny like that I I played uh, for two years before I was any good with the guitar that uh, I just follow what was going and that was it like I had no intention of, of uh, trying to do anything new or anything different that way like I was just trying to, to keep a low profile and not make mistakes that kind of a way but that um, I had a good mind for uh, how you should present the music and how it should be played and uh, um, I was more interested, I wouldn't say I was more interested in that, but I was the one most interested in it, in the band. I was the one who who uh, would uh, kind of decide what way to do it, uh, how to present it, and uh, what type of a, uh, putting together a playlist uh, to have a, a, a kind of a think about what way that should be done, or keeping gear in good order and not having instruments buzzing and squealing and this kind of stuff like I was always interested in the production of the of the, the music as well as playing it like and I did a good bit of, of uh, producing stuff never m much professionally but uh, putting a concert together or um, uh, putting a CD together um, you know songs that I could get them fairly right and to me what right meant was that it would be played fairly professionally and uh, be perfectly in tune that kind of thing that and um, you'd see an awful lot of stuff that came out over what they called irish country and a lot of that stuff was was poorly done like you know just just poorly done but um i'd never really blame anybody for for uh an awful lot of fellas went into a studio that uh, didn't have a good producer or didn't have someone, didn't practice enough before they went in and uh, they kind of depended too much on the producer doing something for them that if they weren't able to do it themselves they had no point in going in to try to record it but an awful lot of fellas came out disillusioned out of, out of a studio after spending a thousand euro and come out with nothing presentable <laughs> you know the, 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 that's the way it is i remember going to stuff in in dublin we always practiced and we always had had our stuff right before we went in but um the amount of time that the studio would spend getting everything right making sure your tuning was right and 
the producers always had good ear that way, like, you know what I mean? And the instruments are better today as well. They had the old instruments that, uh, you, you know, they'd twist and warp and you, you couldn't keep them in tune. That, you know, you'd be tuning it before every song, really, if you wanted to really have it right. But now instruments are so, so good, like, that uh, they stay in tune and would stay in tune no matter how hard you play them, like, but it's um, just a totally different di di different scene and um, I don't know where it is going or where uh, where it will wind up but I know that there's you see very few people local people making it in in uh, where you get a song in the charts and if you look at it there's very little Irish people who can um, break into um, you know if, if you could mention 10 in Ireland that are recognisable worldwide you'd be lucky and uh, one time I had an awful lot more than that like you know and um, even look at the Eurovision the Eurovision is no longer a song contest it's a it's a, a, it's a production uh, competition you know how you can present the song rather than than uh, technically singing or playing or whatever like and maybe that's a good thing maybe it's it, it's popular and if that's what makes music that's grand that uh, I don't know how popular it is but I think that at the moment it's coming back to um, a song that you can anybody can sing you know what I mean the, 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 the young lads <coughs> can can sing along to it there's not a lot of stuff that he can't do that today because it's it's uh, so computer computer dependent like you know that um, I suppose it, it, it's different like if you go to Flack Hall or some of those things that um, you'll see very good music being played at that by young people and uh, I don't think there's uh, the same kind of a gathering for you know the way uh, they have the likes of uh, slain and places like that those concerts that um people go to that there's they don't really go to listen to the music they do to a certain degree but um you can see see good people in a stadium without going to fail it fail and those kind of things are kind of uh it's an outing and it's uh it's um it's an event and uh, you can listen to a good band or a bad band but you can enjoy both of them and um, dance around and, and have a few beers but um, uh, it's a totally different uh, way of doing things like that music has become uh, part of a bigger scene and the, 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 the drink has become a bigger part of the music scene and drugs has become a big part of the music scene and uh, maybe you need to have a, a few smokes or a few sniffs to enjoy some of the music or maybe it raises your 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 enjoyment or your capacity to <laughs> enjoy it i don't know um, uh, if i was to analyze it i'd say that those things do come into it and um i remember music before there was any any um junk in it and at the moment any concert you go to and I've been offered smokes at a concert on more than one occasion and acid and whatever I wanted you could get a honey of those things like but uh, I don't and I never did but uh, I think it's uh, I don't know you'd be getting into a whole different way of doing things if 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 that comes into it and I don't feel uh, I'd be good at judging stuff like that uh, I prefer to listen to everything while I'm sober mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can I think you can get drunk on music I think you can you can uh, uh, release some kind of endorphins or whatever uh, is released when you're listening to music for us to put you in good humor you don't need you don't need to have a whole lot of, of uh, substances or whatever and um, I, uh, I'd prefer to not say too much more about. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we might. Uh, what direction music is going? Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, I've got a few questions I might like to ask you about um, about this local this local area. Uh -huh. um, and when you were growing up, um, oh, we've, we've talked about you know, the, mm. the some of the, the places and nearby towns and the yeah. stage I've been holding that. 
Was there anything about uh, the history or geology of this area that was sort of that it was impressed on you or that you learned about when you were young? Um, not really, but I do remember <clears throat> being aware of what they call RAS and things like that. Like, and uh, there was no um, discernible RA on our farm, but there was one that uh, in one field that when the sun would be at the right level in the evening, it used to shine across the land and you could see the circle of where there was uh, an old RA, but it wasn't marked on any of the maps. I have the, the original maps from from the I I've got one of the ones that was made in the nineteen twenties I think it was made and um, <coughs> I had I had one of those and uh, there was none of those maps none of those RAS on our land but they were on 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 other neighbours land and things like that but um, there was a good few of those around that have been levelled now like you know what I mean that. And uh, lately, people tend not to go near them because the, the, it's against the law. But for years, there was a lot of them knocked down, a big double ras, like you know, unusual things. But that um, was there all. <coughs> them or? Yeah, there was. Yeah, but like uh, I, I never, ne never ran with that. Like that's uh, some some people did, and um, old pish rogues, as they call them, like kind of old old. Uh, um, ghost stories and things like that have one but I, I never never really bothered me. I remember once I got a fright with one, there was uh, one up the road from us uh, on Deacon's land and there was uh, an old guy in uh, Wexford who um, he was uh, he was interested in history and geology and all of that kind of stuff. I remember seeing him one day standing in this ra coming on towards getting dark and a big long stick a big staff and he had a flown white hair hanging down uh, beard and all uh, they called it uh, I can't remember Warren I think was his name but um, he, he was uh, an expert on the local history from that point of view but I did see him one time uh, walking around the rat in, in a neighbour's field but um, no the, the, the people uh, you know the, the kind of uh, all this respected them and walked around them but then sometimes uh, they decided that they could make another couple of acres of land if they knocked them down like you know and that's generally what happened to them but in one sense there was an awful lot of them around this area an awful lot of them like you know there, there could have been four or five on some farms like and I suppose that um, I still don't really understand what they were why they were there were they there to keep cattle from straying that night or were they there to keep cattle from being rustled? Or were they there to, to um, you know, they don't look much at the moment. Like, they wouldn't keep cattle in today. Like, they must have had some, some other way of doing it as well, like, apart from the, the earthworks around it. Like, I really don't know. And, and they've never really come up with a, a plausible idea to why they built them that way, you know? Mm -hmm. I suppose there, there, there was no other... Some places they unearthed uh, posts stuck down in the in the ground, and um, you could imagine a corral built out of something like that. But the big Erton Erton uh, rats, I really don't know how they, how they would have kept cattle in. Like maybe you only had to fence them one day or put a gate on it or whatever. Like you know, but I know uh, I know a rats around where people grew spuds in them. Like you know that that was what they used them for. It was like a little garden. And uh, the work on the inside and today, you can't do that. Like it's, it's outlawed. You can't, you can't grow anything in them. But in most cases, the the cattle go in and graze around there, and sheep in particular. But um, there was a good few around here, and uh, they they run in little clusters. Do you know what I mean? That they be maybe in one town's land to be three or four, and then you could walk four or five more miles and to be another little cluster. Like that, they, they weren't evenly distributed, right? Like that, like you know. And um, they weren't close to a river. They weren't, you know, they, they would have had to draw water to a lot of those as well, like, you know. So I don't know what, uh, how they, they, they operated. And I suppose some uh, experts have uh, a full idea of how they, how they grew them, like, you know, or what, what, what uh, 
expected to expected them to do or for preserving yourself or preserving your cattle or what like you never know what about because an interesting one around here is obviously kind of ruins dens yeah yeah and, you know, <clears throat> the, the supposedly kept horses up there would you know anything no, about that yes yeah. yes I, I i know a little bit about it and uh, there's a mark on the map that shows there around there that that's car here's then but that's up here just over us up there but but that was only uh, the reckon that that he uh, all that to me was a kind of uh, hearsay and big big wonderful stories and stuff like that like he was a highwayman and he was around here and he probably uh, rested out on the mountain somewhere but I don't believe that there was a, a big den you could walk into up there underground that it's not there now i've been up there and uh, there was one uh, little place up there that a guy built during the around the time of the 1916 and there's that 10 years following that up along through the through the war of independence and the civil war and there's a, a place up there and there's a flags all around big stones big boulders and stuff like that and there's water dripping down at the back of it now and he built uh, a kind of a semicircular um, uh, point to put a rifle that he could scan the whole area and uh, that's connected to that house that I was telling you about where the guys had as a safe house and he went up there generally he could have stayed in it for weeks at a time because he would have been on their own himself. Could you maybe just say for the, uh, the tape there just retell that story mm. of the, the man with the safe house? Mm. Mm, yeah. Would you mind retelling no, it in the state? Oh yeah. No, you're still running there. Yeah. yeah. No. Th- th- there's. Um, I'll I'll tell you his name. Yeah. There's um, uh, Cody was the the name, the family name of the guy who was up there, and there was uh, um, like a family of people lived there. Like, but uh, Cody was the 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 man and. The stories go from the time of 1798 and Redcoats and then it changes over to the 1916 thing and the various people involved in that, uh, whether they were British soldiers or uh, one faction of the War of Independence or one faction of the Civil War. And uh, I don't know which of them is true. Or which was not true, but to tell you that there's men buried up there that this was a shot and stuff like that. Like, but I honestly don't believe there was anybody shot up there. Now that uh, I know that there was people brought from one parish to another to be shot by uh, handed over and shot during the civil war. That uh, the local fellows wouldn't shoot them; that they'd bring them and they'd hand them over to a different one. And there's a rat down there in Ratnure, and there's supposed to be a couple of guys shot in that rat. And um, um, I'd have heard that from older guys, but uh, again, I don't know whether they knew or not either. That the story they were telling was somebody told them as well. Like they weren't part of it or hadn't seen any of it or anything like that. Like you know, but um, that guy that I was telling you about before that that uh, was buried in Ratnor that. Um, there would be someone in Ratnor a few years ago would have known who would have shot him and a whole lot of things like that that uh, I, I don't know and um, uh, I know that the guy who told me about them spending the night up there was uh, a son of uh, one of the people involved in the shooting and um, he was on on the, the non-treaty side and he told me told me about that and he didn't know that I lived up close to that and he was only telling me where to spend the night and uh, um, the minute that ambush was over um, they cleared out immediately and uh, they walked to that house up there because that was recognised as a safe house for that faction of the of the civil war and um, uh, everybody in Ratnor knew that like you know what I mean everybody knew that, 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 that he was involved in that but that's um, that has settled down to the extent that uh, I'd say around here um, people recognise that it happened and uh, uh, they acknowledge that it happened that kind of a way but I'd say at this stage there's no one too worried about whether whether it, who was involved in it or whatever like. <laughs> 
But um, that's that's basically what what uh, the way that is up there at the moment, right? I'd be interested as well in um, very keen to talk about uh, you know the early connections and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lasso thing around like the mountain here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The um, the White Mountain and uh, or, yeah. or Mountain Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the music. Would you could you tell me about that tradition and how it's yeah. fluctuated over the years? That, um, I remember the mountain before there was trees planted on it as a young lad and I shot up there uh, grouse and things like that. Like, uh, there are very few grouse up there now, there are none up there I think for the last while. But it um, um, used to be um, a tradition that um, the last Sunday in July people met up there from right on your side and the Carlo side as well and um, you used to have a kind of a dance up there, you know, it was really only, uh, I suppose, something different to the local house dance, but um, I saw the tail end of that in the late 60s, early 70s, when uh, a fellow would bring up a van and he'd have chocolate and uh, bottles of Coke or orange or whatever it would be, and the, he'd be selling those up there and a few lads playing, playing music. But that was all I ever saw of it. But we revived it a few years ago uh, just for the sake of reviving it. And uh, if it was a fine day, you get a right crowd up there and people would be interested, like, you know. But um, there was families there who met their husband or wife up there and, uh, you know, that they, 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 they married and uh, people from the far side to here and I know uh, one person just down the, the road there and uh, they met their wife up there and she, she was from the other side of the mountain like you know but that's the, basically what it was like but um, you see with sheep on the mountain that uh, sheep will go where they feel like and it's only every every when you bring them down to sell them they you round them up and uh, throw the ones that weren't yours and bring on the ones that were yours like you know and that's they were all branded and uh, during the war there's a good bit of turf caught up there during the, what they call the emergency they called it here but it was uh, ran parallel with the war like and and, and uh, when coal was hard to be got or whatever like but it was poor quality turf even like you know but um it, um, it was you used to call it scraw turf then that was usually what was on top of good quality turf but there was no good quality turf under this there, there, there's probably farther down here uh, where there's a lot of water boggy type land and I'd say that's good quality turf but it's, it's never drained to let the water over quickly like so that they could, they could cut it for turf but um, there was just patches of it on flat areas up there and it might be only two foot deep and that was cut for, for fire uh, during the, the, the Second World War. But um, I never had anything to do with cutting turf or whatever but my father-in-law, that was Margaret, came in there and her father cut turf that was brought to Dublin and stored in the Phoenix Park. And that was, I would have uh, just over there, up over Kiltheely. And there's a lot of turf cut there. And the council paid fellas to do that. Like, And he was uh, uh, an overseer with the council. And he, he worked on that. That guy kind thought, of but they'd have to walk maybe 10 miles to it. Like, you know, an awful job. Like, but then all brought away down on our army lorries. And uh, stacked, there was miles of it stacked in the, in the Bailey's Park. Like. But that's the... Uh, I remember people burning turf, but it would have been quite poor quality turf. And they'd be mixing a bit of timber with it, like it wouldn't be all turf. But um, uh, it was before my time, really. That uh, I was born, I suppose, six years after the end of the Second World War. So I saw the very end of the the rationing and stuff like that. But um, I, I knew very little about it. But what I would reckon, and uh, I think I saw the very start of the progression of Ireland from being um, a poor country where everybody was poor, no one had anything. And that's that's uh, the from the end of the war to the end of the 50s. There's been a 15 year period there where even the farmers had no money. And it was all to do with the, 
the, do you remember you used to talk about the economic war and the cattle war and all that kind of thing that where England wouldn't buy stuff off Ireland and all that you know it was all a kind of uh, just bad blood and uh, that was the poorest time in Ireland and I, I saw the tail end of that but did just about see the tail end of it and um, I remember my grandmother uh, sending clothes to certain houses around the place where uh, people mightn't have had the, the money to buy clothes and she'd give, uh, uh, use clothes like the end of the life clothes from my point of view like that you're after growing out of them or but I remember her sending those to specific houses that didn't have clothes or didn't have a, enough clothes like that kind of way. Mm -hmm. I saw the very tail end of that now I, 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 I didn't I didn't um, I was never involved in any of it but I know of it happening and, and, and saw it happening, but uh, that's that's the way it was. Like, um, I might ask one more question. I do do want to get to the, the early. Um, what? How? How would you sum up the way this area has changed since what you described in your early years yeah, to, to yeah, today? Yeah. Um, I suppose up for up until the first ten years of my life, I wouldn't have known anything about being short of money. I never, I know we were never short of money to buy food or anything like that, and that was because we had a farm and we grew most of our own food and stuff like that. Like, but um, I know that there was people who found it difficult to to have enough food and. Uh, um, I'd say two things that changed the thing that Albatross was a factory that was built in New Ross and it was uh, making fertilizer and a lot of guys around here got working there that was a big factory and at the time it was a big factory that, that uh, they were uh, making fertilizer for the for the land and there was um, I suppose the Department of Agriculture began to cop on that um, lime and artificial uh, fertilizer were important, like, but lime, just lime you spread on the ground to change the pH level of the of the soil, that made an awful difference, especially up this high. Now, our farm was down there in very good land, whereas I'm up here now, um, we're, we're a thousand feet above sea level here, whereas our farm is about 300 feet above sea level. So um, land up around here was poor at that time. There was no lime in it, and uh, any granite area wouldn't have lime. So when they started spreading lime, and lime would last for probably eight to ten years, you have to spread it again then. But when they started spreading lime, the land improved immensely. Like you know what I mean, that there's a good guy over here over the road here, and he has he has uh, more than a hundred cows at the moment on land that. 50 years ago wouldn't grow enough to feed 10 cows now, and that is a fact that uh, it's just the way it is and that man his father told me that he saw himself walked cows to New Ross walked cattle to New Ross to sell them and uh, he wouldn't take what he was being offered because he was getting too little for them and he walked them back and the following year he brought them in and he was offered three pounds less for them so now that's the kind of stuff. Another thing that man told me was that uh, the government gave out money for growing wheat uh, to to make flour, and uh, he got the grant for growing wheat, but they never cut it because it didn't grow. You know what I mean? But he got the grant because he sold it, and was entitled to. It. He said, "Is it doing him? I've got money for nothing." <laughs> That's a fact, like those things. And and uh, when we came up here first, 1970, we came up here, there was one car on the lane, and that was it. There was no other car around. I, I, I had a car, but basically because I was earning more playing music than I was doing anything else, but we, we had a car. But I'd say within, within uh, two years after that, an Al Albatross factory inside and Boland's car rental, not car rental, um, um, what do you call it, uh, the never never, the higher purchase. The people working in, in the factory, they see they had a, 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 a regular income. So the higher purchase companies were prepared to sell them cars.
to give them cars on head purchase and the amount of cars that arrived here in a very short length of time I'd say in five years everybody had one now uh, that probably had to do with um, from maybe the mid 50s it began to change I'd say as regards people having a bit more money than that but really up uh, maybe 68 to 73 or 4 everybody had a car then from that time on and um, it was uh, the combination of a factory or two opening up in the place and uh, the availability of cars on higher purchase and everybody had a car then from that, that point on every family had a car there wouldn't have been two cars in most families there would have been one car in, in the house like and that was it but I remember uh, petrol at five shillings a gallon now that would be a quarter of a euro and uh, for a gallon which would be five times more than a litre so that was the the cost of petrol like five, sh- five was shillings that expensive? Was that cheap? Was that five shillings a gallon like if you if you take a, a gallon can there's five litres in a gallon can five a litre today is about 150 140 anyhow and uh, five of those in a gallon was costing five shillings which is a quarter of a euro which would be 25 cents you know and that's that's that, that's the difference like I remember going to Dublin and 30 shillings which would be 150 would bring me to Dublin and back in in a one litre car like that uh, most cars around here were one litre or less than one litre that, uh, and they had trailers behind them to go to the mart or the fair or whatever all those things changed the crop, uh, crops got very involved in in uh, supplying milk and, and you know different things that way that, that, that uh, all happened within a 20 year period around then and that changed the whole face of the place like you know but uh, most people then and the same way what I said about the houses the bungalow bliss type houses and uh, small little little uh, county council estates they provided very good living conditions to ordinary people and uh, uh, they didn't have centre heating they didn't have double glazing but they had a dry clean house and that meant some difference do you know what I mean they, they, and it did make a big difference an awful lot of people and um, I saw a time where the guy who was working in the factory was much better off than the farmer that uh, you know that, 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 that uh, they were earning more money uh, than the farmer was earning like, and, and uh, that lifted the whole spirit of the area like you know that uh, everybody was working and uh, a very odd time then for a couple of years maybe some place had closed down to be a few fellas out of work but in general uh, it's been an upward grade since uh, since during my lifetime that uh, I, I'd say it's improved it hasn't gone backwards only in the last 10 years did that happen like you know where the where the um, the boom and bust and that kind of thing that 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 created its own problems i'd say as well but before that it was a kind of a uh, an upward slope people were better off and doing better and had more more um leisure time rather than working uh, you know uh, farmers one time didn't know when to stop but, um, and work from daylight till dusk whereas uh, now it's a chain and they expected the fellow that was working from to do the same thing <laughs> you know what I mean it was many times um, I'd love to talk about hurling and the connection mm. to this area and, mm. and your family mm. with hurling as well mm. um, can you perhaps just tell me about um, yeah, about how how hurling's developed in this area how your mm. family's connected mm. to well the, 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 what I know about hurling like that I, I, my memories always was that I was the son of one of the great, a member of one of the great Wexford teams, and for that reason, everything revolved around Hurling, and it did. And all the talk and all the places you went to revolved around Hurling, and um, that that would have been up through the fifties, and the the records were the leaders of that. Nicky Record were the leader of it, and two two brothers and. Jim English and my dad were the five guys from this club who were part of that team and uh, they were heroes all their life and that, you, there's no other thing you could say about them, they were every one of them 
and um, I've been to most of their funerals and I've sang at a lot of their funerals and it's that song called Colin's song would have been the song but um, that amount of uh, there was one other club and that was in a scar to the Aidens and they had five guys on that team of the 50s as well and then there was other ones had one or two club on had one or two uh Horswood had one or two new ross had one or two that kind of way that that, that, that it was a small pocket of people but that um that team really got together from the time they were about 14 or 15 from hurling local matches together against each other like you know and that that produced that that 1950s team and those two things that made them household names was the fact that RTE or uh, Radio Ireland at the time started broadcasting the matches and were the names that they had, were heard every Sunday in, in, in the summertime. Everybody knew their name, like, and that, that was it. It wasn't, they were probably the best team of their era. Um, by today's standards, they would be considered slow and uh, probably not as skillful as the fellas today. But um, um, they had different skills, they had a different way of hurling than now. And now it's all possession. And whereas that time, one fellow hit the ball as far as he was able, and then the other two fellows ran for it. And whereas now you hit a ball that's given an advantage to your own man. You know, I mean, the game had changed totally. But that, um, Rat Newer then, along the 70s, um, had a great run that um, we won four in a row and all this kind of thing and played six All-Ireland. We won none of them. We won no All-Ireland. That, uh, that's one thing that the club has never won a club All-Ireland. We played in six and lost them all. One was a replay even. Lost. But uh, that's the, the one thing that the club doesn't have. That uh, We have all, all we have more championship medals in right newer than any other club in the county. And um, we had uh, supplied more men to county teams than anybody else in the in the, the in the county but um that has changed and uh, it's gone gone different now that uh, we only have a couple of lads hitting it not even playing every day you know that kind of way but it's the way the game has gone but um did you play yourself yeah but on, only at a lesser level i uh, i was I, I could hurl well, but I was too slow running. I wasn't able to keep up with him. <laughs> I'd start off going for a ball and if I didn't pass me, I wouldn't get it before I got there. <laughs> but um, I did, I played, um, played in the goal a good bit, probably because I was slow running or whatever, but I was quite a good goalkeeper, at least I was told I was anyhow. Whether, whether it were caught in me or not, I don't know. But, but I never I never played senior for Ratnure. I never played in Ratnure's top team. I played at the next level, which would be considered intermediate, and junior and junior B. I played all those levels, but it was more for 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 sport, more for for fun than, than, than I, at that rate. But I had, I had an awful interest in hurling and, and and in the club and in making sure that the club uh, got on, like you know. But um, I I um, I lived more on my father's reputation than my own. <laughs> <laughs> all the brothers won won, won uh, county championship medals. Like I remember one time going to uh, one of Margaret's two brothers were playing on it, and my three brothers were playing on the team. So we had a third of the team were uh, our children's uncles had they had five uncles playing on the team. Like you know what I mean? Like that you you don't get much much closer uh, um, involvement in a club than that like you know what I mean the, 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 and that's the, the love of a club that everybody knows everybody and uh, everybody I know families around here and for four or five generations would have heard for that newer and uh, it runs in families it does run in families no matter what you go about they might uh, a family have three or four lads on a team and then for uh when they have you done, maybe the next generation wouldn't hurt at all. And the third generation come along, they'd all be the same family again. Like, you know, it's just the way, the, the way it goes. Like, but that, uh, Ratnure was always very much uh, the sport in Ratnure is hurling. Uh, very little football. Any more than they did win a football, football championship in 1952. And my dad was a captain that year. And I have a photograph of myself sitting in that cup 
as a young or taught sitting sitting in that that that, that cup like but that's that's uh, like to me uh, right in your community and uh, centered around Holland really everything that happened in the con in the parish for years was you know what I mean we built the arena down there we built a, I remember that as a blank field down there where I had a, I don't remember the school being built it was built in 54 I was three years of age that was the first building to go on that then the hall was done next and then the dressing rooms and the squash court were built and then the last thing to be built was the Hurling Arena and they did a walking track there a couple of years ago uh, that was two years ago maybe a walking track around it like but that in today's world like that arena down there cost 1.2 million that's paid for there's not nothing owed on that today and that's some achievement for a small parish like you know now we did tap every source of money that was available the lotto Leinster council all that kind of stuff like we we were good at that uh, getting a few pounds from the fellas who had it like you know and um, it's made some difference to to the amount of young lads that are playing hurling because if you are playing hurling over the winter months in the kind of muck they will be out there the women wouldn't allow the young lads into the car you know that kind of way whereas now they come out of uh, astrid harp and there's not a speck on them that uh, they get into a white leather upholstery car and go home <laughs> mm. <laughs> make some difference <laughs> and uh can you tell us um, can you tell me a little bit about Mickey Record as well as kind of a... Yeah, this, uh, Mickey Record, I <clears throat> I knew Mickey Record and I would be one of the people who, uh, Mickey Record actually knew me, but it wasn't because of anything, uh, I wasn't a friend of his or anything else, but in 1965 he was a uh, manager of the team, for the want of a better word, he was the main selector, it weren't called managers at the time. And my dad was playing on that team and I used to go, I was 15, and I used to go to all the training sessions and for that reason, training session that time was backs against forwards and a few chaps on the outside hitting the ball back into them when they drive out. The, 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 that was the training, there wasn't the, uh, now there'd be about 30 or 40 lads in a training session for any county team now, but that time there was maybe 20, 25 and that was it. And uh, like it was then and hit the ball back in when the backs and forwards were there was no second goal involved, that kind of way. But um and uh, the reason Nicky Record knew me he knew I was the son of Martin Codson, and that was about it, like but that um he was uh, um he was like as if he was um the most important man or the most famous man that he'll ever meet. Do you know what I mean? The, 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 he heard his name on the radio and he was such a such a um a star in the Holland end of it. He he was uh, like everybody wanted to meet him, everybody wanted to know him and that's the way he was. Now his brother Bobby, I knew Bobby as a friend as well. I knew Bobby as an ordinary guy that I went to mass with or whatever, like he was in and out every Sunday morning he was in the church and we were up on the gallery and I sat here beside him, you know, this kind of thing. But Nicky was removed from that. Nicky spent most of his time in Dublin. He was in college most of his time, I'll say, because it took him years to qualify. <laughs> For one reason or another. <laughs> but um, the, the, he was still happy, he was laughing himself about him to get him uh, 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 his qualification to get rid of him. <laughs> Well, he was supposed to be a very good vet. That um, he 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 was a vet and, and had a business in in the Scar to himself and a man called Cavana set up uh, together and uh, and he moved to Montlaudy when he after he got married he lived in Montlaudy and uh, he had a business up there and I think he had a lot of a lot of business in Carnu as well which would be in in Carlo Carnu was in Carlo isn't it. Wicklow, like Wicklow, 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 yeah, exactly Wicklow. But he set up, he set up the 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 Carnu Emmets. He he was uh, um, uh, instrumental in setting them up as young lads, hurling like you know. But um, I never, never, uh, I would never have met Nicky socially or anything like that. Like you know that that, that uh, I just knew him as uh, a friend of my father. My father wasn't even see. I don't know whether those has ever had friends. Everybody knew him, and everybody was their friend. Do you know what I mean? That 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 uh, they were they were so well known that that uh, 
that they never hung around together or anything like that, but they, they, they were just in one other's company for 10 years, you know, that kind of way. That's, that's, uh, I knew all of those guys. I remember fellas coming to shoot with Daddy and uh, uh, like Billy Connor and uh, Mick Morrissey. All those people they used to go shooting together and uh, they'd be hurrying for all through the summer and you know, they, they did business together and that was it. Like they were, they were all, all knew one another and that was about it. Like that, uh, I knew most of them as uh, uh, hurlers and then as I got older I used to know them through a lot and through music and what other else thing you'd be meeting them up with. Like Tim Flood would be club on, he was a brilliant musician. I used to play play with him times and and uh, records. Uh, Bobby was locally had a truck, several trucks, and uh, he used to draw beat and stuff from our farm. And uh, you got to know fellas that way, like you got to, to know him outside of Harlan or whatever. But um, Mick Morrissey, um, he was a carlo man as well, and uh, he he played for Wexford at the same time as my dad. And then he went off to America, and um, I'd have known over the years. Then you met up with them all, all of those fellas that get togethers, and most of those get togethers, I was part of the entertainment as regards playing music or whatever. Like, and uh, I got to know every one of them. And uh, sad thing about it is, I probably or uh, uh, I think that was all. It's very uh, honoured to do was play for the funerals. And you know, that, that, that was, you know, it was sad and um, an honour as well, that, uh, but I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, we're guards of honour uh, at funerals and um, well, there's old players and things like that have a, um, a bikes for jersey on them standing and uh, I was often handed a bikes for jersey to stand represent my dad at a few words of his teammates. Yeah. Uh, silly things but uh, just things like that get to you sometimes. And uh, I wouldn't be a sad person at all, but every now and then, when they sit down to talk about things like that, and it's not uh, it's not sadness; it's just pride. As much as anything else, I can know. But that's that's the way it is. Mm. Yeah. And the same the same with music. That um, I suppose I spend so much time. On the road with my dad, and, and, um, we were like brothers, as well as father and son, like, you know, we were. And then um, went through two or three careers in music, different, different stages in music together. And um, I know the direction he was going to go in every song and sing. <laughs> You know, you'd never, you'd never, never, um, you were so used to playing with him that you nearly know the kind of a song that would suit him and how he'd sing it. And he'd be saying, why do you expect from me with the guitar? But, um, I'm usually very practical about things like that. Like you live and die and your era ends, but it doesn't take the sadness out of it, you know. But um, I enjoyed music as much as I ever did. And um, I enjoyed playing with him. And now I'm playing with a whole different group of people all over the place. But, um, but uh, The boss man was an unusual man. He was, he was, uh, I don't think he ever had words of uh, anger with anybody. Even, fe <laughs> even fellas who have killed him, hurled him, like, you know, he still considered him his friends. You know, when the, when the county matches were over, they reverted back to the clubs 
and sort of arrived the Rebbe Terrible in talks like that. I remember one guy that played on the team with him and they played corner forward Tom Ryan, top of man as you ever came across and uh, 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 you know, a very smart guy as regards how to draw a fell out and get inside him or whatever like but my father one day in, in Belfield would be the main pitch in the Scarty and um, Wasman was having a great game, the middle of the field was very normally played, but Tom, Tom Ryan came out and the Wasman was up like this, hitting the ball over his head like that, and Tom Ryan came out and he hit right over the ribs with his head. He broke three of his ribs and punctured his lung. And <laughs> the, most fellas with something like that, like he'd, he'd hold that against them for years, but the two boys were friends the next match again, you know what I mean? There was no more thought about like the part of the game. <laughs> they were just unlucky to be standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> but that was the way that the, the, the hurling was a tough game, like, you know, and, and the fellas accepted an awful lot of stuff they got, like the boss man had broken fingers, ankles, collarbones, broke his collarbone three times and uh, you know, came back from all that and hurled again. And uh, even the last big injury he got when he broke his ankle, and that that muscle there, or whatever tendon that's on on that bone there, came off and slid up along his leg. So that was never repaired properly. But he used to strap up his ankle to such an extent that it wouldn't keel over. But he still played in all Ireland with that kind of an injury. Like you know, that's that's the way that, that it was like. But. No helmets in those days. Hmm? No helmets in those days. No, 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 no. He said the only time he ever got stitched was hurling in America because there was a doctor on the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> but they had a doctor that uh, was part of their, their their team as well. Like, But sure, I don't know why. He used to stitch him as most in that time. But he never got stitches in the head because it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be marked. You wouldn't see the marks. No, no, no. Um, there were different times, like in different ways of doing things, and and uh, you know that that were innovative as well. That they got handmade boots to suit the game, like you know with high high uppers on them that could support their ankles. But um, see, men that time were used to working on the farm, and they they were using high boots on the farm, and their ankles were all supported that way. Then they went out in low ankle boots and were twisting their ankles. So they got a crowd in, in uh, tutties in Nace made the boots and they were, they were um, made of best of leather, real light and everything like that. Like, but they were, they, were, they, they were the first team to get handmade boots to play in, like, you know. But uh, they all had them and it was, it was funny to see them like that. At the end of their days they were nearly falling asunder but they still wore those boots because they were so comfortable to wear, like, you know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, screwing, screwing aluminium cogs in them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, actually. Um. So a little while ago, we had the there was the event down in um at the the Mickey Records Centre in Rathnure, yeah. and um we heard some music from Brady Whelan. Yes. Um, yeah. What can you tell me about Brady and her music? Um, I just remember her from old concerts in local halls, and um, she was uh, quite a good fiddle player. But the unusual thing about her was that uh, she could sing and play the fiddle at the same time. Now, there's probably several people who could do it, but uh, it, it was her specialty. And uh, um, we play usually um, old Irish songs, you know, like uh, uh, Percy French and Thomas Moore and those kind of songs, and and some some of the, you know, e even our local songs. She would have uh, kind of changed and sung around the local sort of local location or whatever that kind of a way. But yeah, she was she was uh, an unusual person that way. But sure, she she played in all the the local halls and places like that but never travelled very far that uh, just was part of the community and played for and it ends as a few bob to be raised there'd be a concert and she'd be always part of it like and that kind of a thing but yeah she was a, a, an unusual an unusual 
a singer and player like you know she, she was involved in it was all uh, a concert situation i never saw her in a session or a sit down session or anything like that it was always at at a concert or something like that but um, she was well known for the, the singing and playing together like yeah you know? And she'd waltz around time too as well. She'd give a bit of a, 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 a dance to go with it when she'd be playing, like, you know, yeah. Mm. And she used to write her own songs, did she? And you mentioned mm. changing names, yeah, changing songs. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, but there were several people down there who used to do that, the, 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 the right bits of songs. Tim Flood could write a bit of a song. Kevin Foley would write a bit of a song. And um, Larry Joyce those fellas always would write an old comic song or whatever actually Paddy Joyce who played for us with us for years the son of Larry's Larry was a, an old an old hand at, at concerts and always involved in entertainment and, and uh, he was a good man uh, there used to be a lot of uh, drama festivals and things like that around he was very good at, at that uh, amateur dramatics type thing but um, would have adjudicated lots of concerts and competitions uh, the what did they call them like there used to be the uh, tops of the town and it was the tops of the parish in a smaller place like but an awful lot of stuff happened that time where where groups got together and did did shows and then went on and a lot of them actually got to all Ireland finals i remember that that clanorch crowd with Brady that crowd got to an All Ireland final. They won an All Ireland actually. With what they had was a trash and scene, and uh, it was all based around that, like you know. But uh, it was it, it was very good, like and and uh, I knew them all, all of those. Now we would have been right on your side of that, and we would have we would have uh, been against them. Uh, you, you know, in competition, and uh, other times they'd be playing with them uh, with. Uh, for a concert or something like you know, that, the, the, all this um, it was never very serious, but everybody helped one another out from concert point of view, like you know, it, it, it always gave people something interesting to do in the winter months, like that, that uh, and you practice and practice and sort of stuff, like and sure, some of it would be so bad, it'd be funny just by being bad, like you know, more of it then was uh, good quality stuff, like and um tim flood is an unusual man tim tim hurled for wexford with, with, with that same team and he was also um all ireland champion at uh training sheep dogs you know that bringing sheep into a into a pen and all that kind of thing he was all Ireland champion, world champion at that actually and he was also a champion uh as uh, irish music so he was a champion at three different things in 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 you know hurling and, and music and the sheepdogs just um a talented man a like, very talented man yeah that's, um and you know that, that that he he was another icon of that wexford team a very local man uh, everything that happened in in club on happened around him and his family and Several other families down there like that were involved in, in, in all kinds of uh, anything that needed to be done in the parish went through him and it was the same in Ratnior with, with our lads like that. Everything that needed to be done, the boss man was involved in, in that as well. Like and he enjoyed it and, and uh, Tim was the same, they enjoyed working together and against each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever the way it was. Yeah. because yeah, there, you know, there are sort of lots of family names and yeah. recognising in all sorts of in, in all sorts that's of ways. right. Yeah, and yeah, be fairly common for yeah families. Yeah, that's to right. Yeah, 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 and and uh, uh, you find in most rural areas that the GAA club. Um, I don't know. It was a major thing to do to start the GAA. Uh, there's no other um, country has anything like it. You know what I mean? That the, 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 the have soccer and rugby, all right, but to have uh, very much uh, a national sport, uh, two sports actually, the hurling and football, and uh, the amount of things that happen because of and through hurling clubs, all money raised for anything needs to be done is raised through hurling clubs and stuff like that, like. And um, it's great that, that uh, 
and you know you meet people from other counties then and they're all the same like i mean they're, they're all involved in raising money for this and new sports fields and like uh, uh, some achievement and uh, the GAA is some achievement and some some organization like and it's all free it's all done done voluntarily like you know and I suppose people uh, get great satisfaction out of uh, being a selector on a team or a trainer or a coach or whatever and um, it's all it's all voluntary <laughs> You know the the top guys are right. You're not supposed to be getting paid for, it, but the top, the top managers and they're all getting paid. You couldn't do it without being paid, like. But it's all speak easy. But everybody knows that it happens just the same, like. Yeah. Might um might sort of close with one uh, last question then. Very broad sort mm. of question. <laughs> Uh, but it's again you, you sort of mentioned local parishes and, and local townlands and that sort mm. of thing we've spoken about you know the local traditions mm. what does it mean to you to be from this area to be from the Blackstairs to be from Wexford to be from around Rassenburg? yeah yeah that, um, it's hard to explain really what, what it means but um, it always comes back down to being um, part of something and uh, you're part of the country first and uh, that's important and then you're part of the county and uh, that's important everybody re wears their county jersey and when you go overseas uh, especially in australia and america and the middle east as well when you see the the county jersey it means something to you like you know and it does to those guys out there and that wouldn't be wearing it like you know and um your county is, um, from a hurling point of view, um, you know, it's great, but your club is the people you went to school with and the people that uh, are nearly good enough to make county teams. And most fellas hurling at senior level in any county will get a run on the county team in uh, some kind of a league or something that mightn't be top notch team but most people w could claim to have played for their county and uh, that's a big honour but the club is the most important thing now and, and uh, you'd wonder about that when you see some brilliant county teams and uh, then when, when all that's over they all fall away and go back to their clubs and play, play uh, ferocious games against their teammates on the county as a club player do you know what I mean that they're playing against each other then for maybe three months of the year again and then they all come together and play for the county but to me um, I was born in uh, Tlobon parish which would be the, the um, our greatest rivals of the Tlobon but uh, we went to school in Ratnur so it was where you went to school is what counts really as the young lads that you start out with like but that um I'd I'd consider myself definitely uh part of, of Wexford and um uh I'd secondary I'd consider myself um a kind of southeast more so than Leinster. I'd I'd consider ourselves uh Watford, Kilkenny and Carlo would come into the southeast with Wexford like and um, I'd, I'd uh, have a lot in common with lots of guys at the other side of the mountain and up Wicklow and places like that but that um, would be quite parochial in my thinking really like you know that um, but I could understand all other parishes are the same like you know and uh, um, you can have great regard for other parishes but your own one is the most important like you know and it's it's not that you think any less of people from other places it's just that uh, it's your affiliation to an area or whatever like and um, I quite like this side of the parish as well this this just uh, part of the mountain and uh, that was always uh, kind of um, I was always proud to be a mountain man really but uh, I'm an honorary mountain man but I'm here 50 years and I'm still a, an honorary mountain man. <laughs> You'd have to be reared up here to be a mountain man. <laughs>
<laughs> that road that he drove up there, that concrete road, we built that ourselves. The council paid paid the money for it, but there's about 15 people here who put in the time to build that road. And uh, what it was, um, the council got uh, some kind of a grant from the EU to improve rural roads. And that was the scheme that we were we were involved in here. And what it was that the council supplied the concrete and we supplied the work. But the council could claim our work as well. We did the work voluntary, but the council could claim that back so that they got most of the cost of building the road from EU. But um, like those days, one day we put on 40 lorry loads of concrete. Now that takes some operating in a place like that. Fellas standing below it so the two trucks wouldn't meet in the lane and all this kind of thing. One crew going ahead putting down the skids as they call them, the, the farms at the side of the road and then more that's come along putting out the concrete and smoothing it down along. But like that's something that I'd be very proud of, that we did that as a community. And that's just this lane up along. You know what I mean? Now and all that the the all the expansion joints on that were cut by Justin the son of mine. Who uh, we hired a big road saw and cut the cut the joints on, but that's those kind of things, right? That that uh, those mean an awful lot. That road means an awful lot to us because it was such a disaster before that was done to it. There's holes in it the whole time, and being cut out with floods of water and stuff like that. But we for eternally eternally grateful to. The council engineers around the place, Eamon Hoare and people like that who made that happen for us. Do you know what I mean? Now, there's several more done around the country now, but we were uh, the first area to do that. And uh, that meant a lot, like, you know, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a brilliant road compared to some of the local roads, like, you know. But um, six inches of concrete with steel in it, going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Matt, I think we might wrap up there. Yeah. Um, unless there's anything else that no, we can't no, be about. To no, no, you're, uh, I'm happy enough. You're happy. I'm happy enough. Okay. Uh, what we might do then is a couple of things that we might do first, and then I might also, if, if, um, uh, so, um, this would be Corrigan, this area. Corrigan, yeah. yeah. Corrigan. Uh, uh, so, uh, you were born 1951. Born 1951. And you've been here 50 years. Yeah, um, when we got married, we moved up here. This was our, our, our about, I suppose, four or five months after getting married, we bought this place. And it was Clairborn that you were from? You were born in? As Askin Farney. Yeah. yeah. I-S-K-I-N-F-A-R-N-E-Y. Yeah. yeah. And then... about it um, and what, what actually what did your uh, parents do farmers, farmers yeah. Yeah. Um, okay I think that is pretty much it they just needed to make yeah. sure I got those last yeah. two so thank you very much Martin. no, no problem at all yeah yeah. yeah yeah no de definitely yeah no I just, yeah. <laughs> just think there's something else there as well that I didn't mention at all but that, um, I was telling you about my grandfather with the lad coming with a gun with no bullets in it, but there used to be field days held around the place to see sports things like uh, bicycle races and running and jumping and stuff like that, but it was a tug of war. You know, there was a field down near Askin Farn, you know, and it would be a big sports day in it every year, but this particular year must have been 23 or 24, 1923 or 24, but... There was a, um, a row over uh, who won the tug of war, the uh, foul play or whatever like that. But it was it was uh, figured out when some fellow produced the revolver. <laughs> <laughs> you know the the, the 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 civil war was over, but they still carried the guns. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay. 